So tidal deposits, or tidal facies, contain very distinctive features that reflect the variation in flow speed and direction from tides through time. All right, so the flow speed changes produce a wide range of grain sizes. In particular, uh, it contains mud. And this mud is accumulating when the flow speed is very low at high and low tide. Um, and then the larger grain sizes depend on the sediment that's available and supplied um, to that zone. Almost always um, it includes sand. And because the mud can become consolidated, you can end up with um, mud clasts. And those mud clasts are ripped up from, uh, from the local environment. And of course, larger grains can be deposited in tides if you have a high enough flow and a source of those large grains. So the wide range of grain sizes are that their deposition is separated in time uh, by the duration of the, the tides. And it produces a distinctive um, sedimentary characteristic where you have mud drapes that can be mixed in with sand that's deposited in ripples or dunes. Right? So you have uh, layers of mud inside cross stratification that indicates that the flow speed was high enough to produce that cross stratification but then slow enough at another period of time that you can get this mud accumulated. So the second characteristic of tides is that the cross-lamination, cross-stratification shows evidence of transport in multiple directions. So you can say the cross-strat and or the cross-lamination uh, show transport in multiple directions. So there are two directions, onshore and offshore, are typically thought of as being common in tides, but if you have a tidal bar or topography, you can end up with currents being deflected in um, multiple directions. Okay? So this transport in two directions also happens with waves, of course, but there's a fundamental difference between tides and waves. In the case of tides, the flow in, in each direction is sustained for a long period of time. So it takes hours for the tide to flow in or flow out, versus waves where the alternation in uh, transport direction that you see on the wave ripples alternates on the time scale of seconds or tens of seconds. Okay. So this transport in two directions, I'll say, uh, for hours. Uh, in each. Okay. And this flow produces uh, two distinctive um, characteristics, one of which is the herringbone cross stratification, which I will sh draw an ideal version of it where you see transport in one direction in one layer and transport in the other direction in the other. So that's at cross lamination if it's ripple or stratification if it's dunes, right? And then, and then the second one was reactivation surfaces. So I'm going to draw that a little bigger here. And that would be where you have that erosion surface within the cross stratification. So this bed form was migrating to the right, there was a change in the flow direction that eroded part of it, and then it continues migrating to the right in here. And so that red line is the reactivation surface. So if we look at 
tidal facies, the types of things we expect to see, are these reactivation surfaces, herringbone cross stratification, mud drapes, mud clasts, and overall a large range of grain sizes. There's one other um, structure that I would like to add. We haven't talked about what actually happens at low tide. And at low tide, the tidal flats are exposed to air, and when mud is exposed to air, it loses water and contracts, and you form mud cracks. Okay. So you end up with these mud drapes if the area is submerged um, during a slack tide, high or low tide, um, but if the mud is exposed at low tide, you end up with mud cracks. So each one of these can be produced in other environments, uh, but they are very common in tidal environments. So if you look at a, a sequence of rocks that has uh, a many of these features, um, uh, it's could easily be, a, a reasonable interpretation would be that it reflects tidal deposits. So tidal facies are quite distinctive and thanks for watching.